All right, here we go. Very good. Um, so uh, welcome back everybody to this uh, second part of the first day of the uh, uh, Circles workshop on uh, traffic and autonomy. I'll be chairing uh, this uh, session and I'm really excited uh, for this first talk to introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Francesco Borelli, who is the FANUC chair in mechanical systems in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at UC Berkeley. Uh, um, Francesco uh, received his laureate degree uh, from the University of Napoli and a PhD um, in automatic control from ETH Zurich. Um, he's been known for his uh, strong contributions in model predictive control and the book that he wrote on that topic. And he has been uh, at uh, Berkeley since 2005, uh, if I remember correctly. He has won multiple awards, including the 2009 NSF Career Awards, as well as the 2012 um, IEEE Control Systems Technology Award and was elected in uh, 2016 as an IEEE Fellow. And uh, at Berkeley, he's also the founding director of the Hyundai Center. Uh, and I assume that uh, this will be part of what we hear about today. Uh, for his talk um, on autonomy. And I think with this, uh, Amaury, if you unshare your slides, we should be able to have Francesco uh, share his slides. Welcome, Francesco. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for inviting me here. And thanks for the nice, kind introduction. Um, and it sounds a very interesting workshop. It just ended up between I uh, teach uh, classes and uh, uh, and so I'm coming in from class. I missed the first part of this. Uh, let me share my screen. I accepted to uh, give this talk also because I'm presenting things that I, I, we have been working on for five years and I've never presented. Uh, let me share uh, my screen. Uh, so I'll be... I uh, should be able to see my screen. I don't know, let's say, if I bring this in presentation mode, that is this gonna work? Uh, do you see which one of the two screens you see? With one uh, of the side notes? We see, yeah, we see it in somewhat reduced format and we do see your usual, notes. Usual problem. Let me, let me just duplicate this. Second. Okay. Let me probably turn my video up for this point. It's... Share again. So now. Perfect, you're full screen. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to present this, the work that I've been doing over the past five years with uh, Hyundai Census Network and White Sense. White Sense is a Berkeley startup, uh, which has been doing very interesting work on connected uh, uh, electrified vehicles. Um, uh, lots of people have worked on this. You'll see some of the cool videos, and it's all the work of the graduate student and the uh, uh, researcher that helped during this uh, project. So I believe this is a community. I have uh, I've read a bit about Circle. It, seemed, it, it, it is my understanding that it's a community that agrees, but we all agree that connected uh, autonomy will be good for the transportation system, right? So there's a lot of things you can do when vehicles are connected and they're automated, and uh, there's a lot of benefits you can gain if you're able to show that this technology works. So in an ideal world, um, some reason this is, my computer is slow. Okay, in an ideal world, you have 
this uh, Uber mobility control system, which will take all the information can from the environment, from the map, from the weather, from the traffic forecast, will get on the right hand side a performance index, say you want to minimize energy efficiency, you want to minimize CO2 emissions, you want to maximize traffic flow, and they will control infrastructure, transportation, and users in a way that in a way that this oh. uh, that this performance index is uh, uh, minimized. Uh, clearly, this is a very challenging optimization problem. It's a large scale multimodal and it's context dependent. Uh, yeah, you have a complex constrained distributed control where you need to guarantee performance and safety. When Once you start controlling vehicles, then you are uh, vehicles in mixed traffic and, and understanding what users do when they are not controlled, then it's a big challenge. Once you try to implement control policy, with limited computational resources, trying to balance cloud versus electronic control unit, that problem becomes even harder. I have been, you know, also during COVID, I've been really been thinking about what do I what do I do in my lab that is relevant? And, you know, if I'm not able to have an impact in this world in the next two or three years, I'll stop working on it. So the market is very hard. It's extremely fragmented, and there's a lot of players which are very conservative, have very little resources. Okay, so what I want to do today in 20 minutes is to share what I've been doing uh, in this area, uh, and focus and showing you that you know all the problems I'm going to show you they're actually being implemented on actual experimental vehicle. So and why the market is hard, you know, you on you have the infrastructure side on the left hand side. We actually are, uh, we needed to write software on the gateway, which goes into the uh, uh, um, traffic light, which is connected to the sensors on the road, right? And you are to write software on cars, and these cars have a complex uh, network of electronic control units. And well, depending on which feature you want to use, some will go into the embedded part of it, some will go on the electronic control in the sound will go, you need to change the protocol of the uh, uh, communication system. You can uh, change, you can actually control users by using a phone app, right? Giving routing, providing more high level uh, granular recommendation, changing speed, changing lanes. And that's something I've been looking at as well. Um, so the, if you take the original control problem, what we did, we were we got this award five years ago. It's called Next Car, Next Generation of Energy Efficient Vehicles from our, or Connect Energy Efficient Vehicles, and we've just been recently awarded the second phase. And so what we said, since the problem is very complex, we are going to assume that this mobility ideal mobility control system is going to sit on. Uh, 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 behavioral level where you can actually switch between different behaviors that will achieve your goal. Maybe efficiency, uh, sorry, the, the type of their energy efficient platooning or uh, a smart approach and departure traffic intersection or eco routing versus regular routing. And so, the, and, and what our place really focused and actually what our project was focused on trying to understand what are the lowest hanging fruit in these behaviors that will bring energy efficiency to the uh, 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 to the United States? So, uh, what I want to do is to give you a summary. It's a very short summary of the next car, the phase one and the phase two. Give you a highlight of the control methodology we use and some outlook. And you know, feel free to interrupt me anytime. We already uh, try to leave a few minutes for questions. Um, so what is what we did in in uh, in RPI? We focus on a set of connected and cooperative eco strategies with measure savings in real world. Okay, so this strategy had to do with highway. So we are focusing on cooperative adaptive cruise control and speed harmonization with connectivity, on urban driving and arterial, focused on V two V and V two I. Uh, using eco approach and departure signal as intersection, and on routing, uh, they were, uh, uh, deploying eco routing on uh, uh, um, uh, on actual mobile app. They were focused on P 
PHEV and electric vehicles. So it's all about electrified vehicles. And they were measured in the real world. We actually had cars, we have an old fleet and we have a new fleet coming up of electric vehicles, pretty cool. Uh, the, sec the first version was on all on L2 autonomy. The new version, the new product is all about L4 autonomy. So uh, the control schema that we have designed are of two types fully centralized so we assume that there is a controller here at a local in a local geographic network maybe close to the traffic light that will send commands uh to all the vehicles connected to it so they would be a full centralized and it's locally meaning this is geographically uh distributed or decentralized so there is a, an individual controller doing computation and communicating in the fleet okay with uh, with infrastructure we have been doing some work on distributed this i'm not going to talk about it where there is shared computation it's also extremely hard to implement so i'll just focus on the first two um the platform that being you will see data and videos is this car which is a 200 2018 hyundai ionic is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicles when we work with we started with it was the most energy efficient car in the united states uh we uh, instrumented with the V2X uh, DSRC. Now DSRC is old. We are replacing this with 5G. And we had control of whole, the whole vehicle, from steering to powertrain. It, it had both an internal combustion engine. And uh, I mean, Hyundai was an amazing player with this. And we had five of them for our uh, platform. We also, I mean, the key of the project was actually to measure uh, fuel efficiency. And so we instrumented these cars with high precision fuel flow meter with, uh, you can see here uh, with uh, current and voltage uh, probes. So for the battery, this was our disk space where we're doing fast uh, compu uh, control computation. This with, and this was our matrix where we're doing control comp dynamic programming at a higher level. This was everything was connected through the clouds and talking to the infrastructure. Um, before uh, going on to the road, we had this cool setup, which is unique in the industry, uh, where the car sits in a dyno. Uh, the car is simulated into a vehicle uh, dynamic simulator. So in this case, it would be pre-scan. And pre-scan is a micro, uh, it, it, it simulates each individual level, uh, vehicles at individual level. Those models are not great. It's good for doing uh, a simplified blocks or city model. The Q and the other vehicles were generated for a macro level simulator. In this case, we use VSIM. So, and this VSIM was actually fed from data from the queues from census network. So we had all this loop where Traffic queues were from Sensing Nexo were uh, updating the VSIM, which was updating the uh, how many vehicles we sh should generate in pre scan, which were, was where the vehicle was actually moving in the virtual world. And in the real world, the vehicle was moving in the dyno. And everything was in total closed loops. If there was a vehicle in front here, the, the virtual ego vehicle will slow down, the real ego vehicle will slow down. You will measure what will happen in terms of energy losses uh, or energy improvement. Um, let me tell you the results. We, this was very exciting. It was, it was a, a four-year project. Uh, the numbers are quite impressive. You can get out of the, this again, this is one of the most, at this point, there's probably a better, a, a more fuel efficient vehicle, but at that time was the most fuel efficient car in the United States. You can get a 30% energy efficiency on arterial uh with some uh time additional time you can get a 20 percent on highway and you can get roughly 10 percent on eco routing okay these were measured uh, uh energy efficiency with this connected platform of five vehicles over a number of trials and over uh, over three years so uh how did we get that how did we what you know, what was the again I want to share with you rather than you know uh, advertise how uh, great the team was to share the challenges and the, the things that made made this uh, project work. Uh, there were two things and I'll go very quick here. Uh, classical model predictive control was not really working in the sense that we needed a way of using data to update our cost functions and our safety set and so we use this uh, what we would have been working on in my lab on learning model predictive control 
uh, I'm gonna go where uh, I think this is an educated audience here. So we have uh, in the classical minimizing objective function, this was the model of the vehicle input and state constraints. What would happen is that the cost to go and the safety set were updated using uh, data. And it's actually used a very simple, it, it's called learning about MPC. It's actually one of the most uh, theoretical, interesting thing that my lab has been doing over the past five years. A uh, very uh, highly cited paper in the transaction here because it's practical. And so the idea is super simple. You imagine you have a, you're going from A to B on a route one day, and you're going, uh, you change your control action. Uh, so the upper index is the, uh, sorry, day zero. Okay. And that's the upper index. X is your state. The lower index is the time. Okay. And this trajectory is some associated comfort, safety, and energy efficiency. You, you up the, based on this trajectory, you update your controller, and the next day you're gonna have another trajectory over the same route, okay? And so what will happen is that we use these data points, we take the convex hull, and we contextualize with respect to time, okay? So at this point in time, given this traffic condition, this is going to be your safe set, and it's gonna be the cost to go on this safe set. And we all these things was done in the cloud, and the what you would push on the electronic control unit was a a polynomial approximation of these sets. So that's this this the methodology that we used for uh, learning model predictive control on the vehicles. Um, the other part that was useful in some application was the real time model predictive control part. It's hard to run this optimization on electronic control units. So you have the classical online approach, you have the classical explicit MPC where you try to compute the regions, you have the classical gridding approach. We, we try to approximate primal and dual with neural networks. And I was skeptical at the beginning, uh, but it worked pretty well. Uh, you know, the idea would be that you run the primal you run a model predictive control with a lot of samples and you learn the MPC primal policy. You also learn the MPC dual policy. So you have two networks, the primal neural network and the dual neural network. And then in real time, you basically use the dual network to certify. And if you can't certify it, then you get a backup controller. So again, you collect data, you learn the policy, you, that's what you deploy on the ECU, this, the primal policy and the dual policy in form of a neural network. Now there are a lot of control units that can do actually very quick evaluation of these neural networks. Just to give you an idea, uh, if you compare with CVX Gen, that's what's used with by SpaceX. Okay, a, a one of our uh, problem that would take twenty milliseconds now becomes uh, zero point one milliseconds. You have less ROM and RAM usage for if you use this approach. So. Well, let's see, let's look at case studies, okay? We have uh, an uh, architecture that is the uh, eco rod, eco drive and eco charge at the top level, a motion control and the powertrain control. This was, this top size is on the cloud. This is what the startup uh, of uh, UC Berkeley's delivering is delivering services for electrified vehicles and the bottom sits on the, uh, on the vehicle. Um, eco charge, it means, how much should I charge the battery or should I use the internal combustion engine? And production vehicle, this is uh, Berkeley to Facebook. Uh, production vehicle use a charge depleting, charge sustain mode. So use also, first use all the battery and then use the internal combustion engine. Uh, this is a function of traffic profiles, okay? That's not the best policy. Uh, and uh, um, I'll skip, we, we don't have much time left, but what we do, we learn, features, uh, if you have a lot of data of traffic profile, we learn features of this traffic profile data, and these features will affect how the cost uh, is shaped uh, uh, for what concerns powertrain optimization. The results is, uh, show you the results later, okay? Um, so just, I think the important part, there is a, a cloud part that updates the feature of the cost to go, and there is a real-time MPC that controls the powertrain on the electronic control unit. The eco drive is very simple. It's a, uh, is a, uh, a, a double integrator model. 
uh, where you minimize the cost, which is a trade-off of between positive real energy and travel time, okay? And these are two versions. The one on highway uses a, you wanna, you wanna smoothly track the front vehicle at higher level reference speed, which comes from the eco charge. You wanna maximize regenerative braking and exploding long-term uh, forecast. The arterial one actually now becomes a stochastic MPC where you want to use the current phase signal uh, to, and you wanna use historical signal phase and timing for the future. So we saw here uh, stochastic MPC using a two level approach. There is dynamic programming um, at higher level that does a speed planning and the cruise control that uh, uh, changes the speed according to the current signal and the uh, statistics of the future signals coming ahead. These statistics were collected using, um, would you see, sorry, by using census NACTO data. I have a few minutes left. Uh, let me show you some, some results. Um, uh, we, we ran, we are running these five vehicles are running in Richmond first, uh, San Francisco, Hanheim. This is where Disneyland is. And this is uh, Live Oak corridor. Live Oak was our one of our uh, uh, main focus because that's where Census Network as the Census Network in the meantime has been acquired. It has eight adaptive traffic light. There's a 2.5 kilometer. Um, and you know we we have a lot of data on this uh, of the vehicles on this on this uh, uh, corridor. Uh, you can see the numbers: thirty-one percent improvement. If you are willing to to have eight uh, percent uh, more in time, uh, what's interesting, of course, is so you know it's so cost based. If you want, you can actually say that you in, the importance for you is actually you want to optimize time, so you want to go through maximum throughput and, not, and forget about MPG. At that point, the controller strategy will change. And that's what we did here. Um, this is a cool video. Uh, I've presented this a year before the pandemic and somebody said this was, a, this was, a, uh, was questioning if this was real <laughs> in the sense it can be done by any animation engine. These are the three cars. They are talking to each other. They are talking to the traffic light. They are in a full autonomous mode. Uh, full meaning longitudinal autonomous mode. The traffic light will turn on, okay? And you will see how they, you know, the difference between human driven and instead this, this is uh, all smooth and looks like a, a platoon, okay? Using forecast mm -hmm. of the traffic light ahead to control the speed. Um, you know, it's a pretty impressive demo. This is, we were able to do this, uh, you know, with, a team of 10 uh, people from Berkeley and from the companies. And it was, uh, there's a lot of uh, engineering involved in making this type of uh, controller work. Um, let me, you know, let me conclude. Uh, well, in highway, uh, um, we be had two cars, one human driven by human in front, the other one by the use, the, uh, uh, our autonomous controller, which is controlling the, charge, the cruise control, and the powertrain. And of course, we did test by switching both of them. So there's a number of tests involved to uh, uh, showing, to actually proving that you can actually say improve efficiency. You can see here, this you get a 20% improvement by just doing smoothing on the profile and adjusting the powertrain control. Uh, it turns out that with traffic free flow, you got very little improvement. And this has to do because the way the engine operates, uh, 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 with in free flow, the human is pretty good and working at the sweet spot of the engine if it's uh, if it's not an aggressive driver. What is coming up? We have IL4 automation, all focus on electrified vehicle, and I'm gonna move away from uh, MATLAB uh, pre uh, uh, and PreScan and do a full open source. This is something that your community might be interested in. We are developing for phase two a whole open source platform where you can test all L4 automation. So we have Carla, which is a, a, a virtual environment. We have control functions written in ROS. The car lives in the virtual environment as well as in the real environment. So this is a demonstration here. Let me show you a video uh, instead of going through the whole set open source setup. Uh, what you see here is Richmond Field Station. The vehicle is doing, is doing move, moving, it's an autonomous vehicle at Richmond Field Station is projected in the virtual world. And in real time, 
both the real vehicles and the virtual vehicles are sensed by the vehicle. Okay, so uh, this is a virtual map of Richmond Field Station, and this is the vehicle driving, uh, thinking it was in the real, in the virtual world, but also sensing the real world. And of course, here uh, controls are still to be tuned. Uh, conclusion. Uh, I think the opportunity is tremendous. You have seen the savings. The problem is extremely hard. I, I, one of the hardest part, you know, we are, I think this community is mostly a control community, but once you go on the sensing side, if you want to reconstruct the environment, uh, merge what each vehicle senses, this is one of the challenge, most challenging problems that we have. The market's super hard. Are you selling to OEMs? Are you trying to convince cities? We went, we went and talked to a lot of cities uh uh we are you trying to go to google and try to get any of the some features on the phone um we'll see but we you know that is one of the biggest things that i've been thinking because if we are not able to do that then our research has no impact thanks for your attention thank you so much uh francesco that's super exciting and impressive um, I'll ask the first question and folks can please raise their hands or uh, if not, um, uh, chat their questions and I can read them. Um, so th this is super exciting. One uh, question I had regarding your trip from Berkeley to Fremont. I love the idea of having a, a traffic aware use of uh, the motor versus the battery or sorry, the battery versus the gas. Um, what notion of forecast do you need for traffic? Obviously, if you had perfect traffic forecast, I assume you'd do better than if you don't know what's coming or if there's unexpected. But um, when you have that formulation, what, what type of um, forecast uh, information do you usually assume? Yeah, we have a, a let me, let me show. so what we do, we have a, a PDFs, right? They ditch uh, time and space. Uh, we have probability distribution maps, and then we simplify them as mean and range. With so we use a threshold with a, with a variance. The what we uh, uh, we don't do yet, which is and that's that's where the you are the expert in. We realize, and of course, uh, you know this very well. There's this bimodal, multimodal distribution that suddenly there is an accident, and then your forecast is totally off. And so we don't do this yet. Actually, we don't have. Uh, we don't store multimodal distribution in the cloud and we don't handle multimodal distribution in the traffic forecast. Thank you. Um, I had another super quick one. I noticed on the last video you showed with a triple platoon uh, that they switched lanes when the white truck in front switched lanes. Was this related or was it completely uh, um, unrelated? Well, it was, was unrelated. It was, uh, that was a, a um, a, a test that we needed for now was just, uh, but it was unrelated. The, the lens which was initiated by a human. Okay. Okay. So this is what we have to do in phase two. In phase two, we have to demonstrate lens switches, uh, longitudinal and lateral control, uh, fully autonomous. Thank you. Very good. Um, it, does anybody else have any question that uh, you want to ask Francesco? Maybe just one technical question. Really enjoyed the talk, Francesco. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I'm interested a little bit in hearing on some of the deployment architecture for the open source platform. Uh, is anything going to change in terms of like the onboard computing that you'll be using? And can you say more about, uh, you know, like what what computers on board? Is it is it strictly ECU, and will you be converting that ECU to be able to run Roth code, for example? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It's ongoing, and we I'd be happy to share all the details. Uh, we still have. The ongoing platform is still uh, at three levels. There is electronic control units, uh, uh, which we use now just as a gateway. There's a disk space where we do fast computation if you want to do powertrain. And then there is a powerful computer where we are doing all uh, planning and long-term MPC. The server, the Carla server, that's where the, the, uh, um, where the whole environment is simulated. At this point, it's sitting, it's another powerful computer on, in the car. So we have one ego car, right? The question is when you have multiple uh, cooperating uh, vehicles, uh, where are you gonna put that server, right? And so that is the, the one we are going to, we are trying to figure out. It's, if it's gonna be either on the cloud, then we need that some form of 5G connection to that server, or it can be replicated on each car, but then needs to be synchronized. That is the challenge that we have now. At this point, we have only one car, and so the car server is sitting on the vehicle. 
the, the, the one that is basically simulating the whole world, right? The challenge is going to have when you have two real vehicles, so both vehicles have to belong to the same virtual environment. Both vehicles have their own sensing, which and they're sensing the real world. And then there is the a single virtual environment that is, of course, played. That is the that is the challenge. ROS2 allows to do that. You can actually uh, that, and unfortunately we have everything coded in ROS1. So we are switching to ROS2. Uh, and that if we do that, it seems that the platform would be probably easier to distribute to uh, uh, to figure out uh, i'll let you know once we i'll let you know once we are able to put those together yeah i was gonna say it's really a pity we can't do these things in person because i can imagine spending four hours after the meeting is over just griping about ross versus ross too and what's worth it and what's not because that's how uh, i would love to talk to you it just uh, we are you know i and some of we have a new team those team has graduated from up i would love would love to i agree when you know next time maybe you guys come here in berkeley <laughs> Uh, that right. I'll, I'll join. I'll join your next circle meeting in person. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we have a last super quick, we can do one more, and otherwise, we'll we'll go to the next talk. Uh, I see Eugene is waiting. Okay. All right. Well, Francesco, thank you so much again for the wonderful talk. It was really awesome to have thank you. you. Thanks for inviting uh, me, Alex. Uh, and John Jonathan, and stay on, thank uh, you. I'm sure you're, you don't have enough Zoom time these days, so you can stay on for the whole two days. I will say partially on. There's somebody knocking at the door. I have I office know. hours. I'll pretend that I'm not here in the <laughs> knocking. Very good. But thank you again so much. So it's my pleasure to introduce the next oh, speaker. Hold on one uh, second, Alex. Let me uh, oh, just reset pause. the recording. Yep. Absolutely.